Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Chesapeake Food Shed Network um, Virtual Food System Webinar Series. I'm Lindsay Smith with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. I'm also a member of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network and have been collaborating with the network's Farm to Institution Workgroup to offer yesterday's and today's food safety webinars. Um, we're so pleased to welcome you and our expert presenters today. Welcome to everybody. And um, thank you also to our webinar and Chesapeake Food Shed Network supporters. Next slide, please. We're just gonna give you a quick introduction. Um, and for those of you that may not be familiar with the Chesapeake Food Shed Network, here's the mission of the CFN. And if you participate in or support the extraordinary work happening across the region, um, as well as our mission, please participate in the CFN. Um, anyone who supports the vision is welcome. And you can visit, visit chesapeakefoodshed.net to find out more and sign up. Um, in addition to today's webinars, um, we have some food safety webinars that dig a bit deeper from last year, as well as a, well as a host of other um, resources on the website. Um, these webinars provide a platform to catalyze connections around specific food system topics with the experts like we're featuring today. And they're open to change agents across the Chesapeake Bay and across the country. Um, to extend learning, sometimes we identify ways for people to engage and dig in deeper following the program. So your evaluation and questions will help us understand if we should go further on this topic at the end of today's webinar. Um, next slide, Yona. Um, so today's um, and yesterday's webinars are brought to you through um, a collaboration with the Chesapeake Farm to Institution Workgroup. This is a partnership between the Chesapeake Food Shed Network and Healthcare Without Harm. Um, they are also working with me here at the Council of Governments, the COG, and our local food distribution work group um, to shape uh, today's webinars. And I just want to thank quickly the Chesapeake Food Shed Network for providing such critical support in organizing the series and doing a tremendous job on promotion and outreach. I also want to thank our work group co-chairs. Um, for helping to shape the webinars, identify speakers, and catalog resources for additional learning that I think you're all really um, going to um, find very helpful. Um, yesterday, as part one of this food safety webinar, Kristen Markley told us a little bit more about Chesapeake Food Shed Network's um, the Farm to Institution work group's work. And at the end of um, today's webinar, we'll share a little bit more information on how you can get involved. Um, yeah, next slide, Fiona is great. I'm with the Local Food Distribution Work Group at the Council of Governments. We are a relatively new group, and we are a place for interested farmers, farm organizations, um, local food distributors, big and small, food businesses, planners, and a host of others to come together to learn about the supply chain, to form business relationships and partnerships. Um, and to identify common issues to be addressed to grow the local food economy in the national capital region. Um, we welcome members and often have presenters from outside this region as well. We know that our food shed is bigger than um, just metropolitan Washington. And if I would be happy to give you information about our past webinars, upcoming meetings, please feel free to reach out at any time. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to show, again, Kristen Markley's contact information. Kristen is one of the Food Shed, uh, the Farm to Institution Work Group co-chairs. She's also with Healthcare Without Harm. Um, please feel free to reach out to her. Um, Healthcare Without Harm is partnering in a, uh, in, with a variety of folks to get more healthy local food into healthcare settings, settings around the country and the region. Um, next slide, we'll get to the main event here, today's webinar. Um, <clears throat> so real quickly, we just wanted to do a couple housekeeping items to help the webinar um, flow smoothly. Um, we're just gonna, every, we're gonna ask all of our participants to take a look at your um, Zoom screen. So if you'll just go to the Zoom control panel, which is below the slides, if you just, um, uh, 
below the slides, you'll find your toolbar will pop up. Um, you can see the chat and the Q&A option. Um, and just again, just hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom screen. You know, if you would show folks that again, that would be great. Um, so please feel free to open the chat box and um, type to all the participants and the attendees your name, affiliation, and where you're joining from, just to help everybody know um, who's on the webinar with us today. And then um, during the webinar, we'll use that space to share links and other information from our presenters. And then also in the Q&A box, um, please feel free to post questions for the presenters at any point as they come up for you. Um, we'll collect all the questions, we'll have a Q&A at the end, and um, we will also send a follow-up email with recording, all of today's slides, resources, and a request for your evaluation. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our moderator today. Brian Moyer, um, we'll see him pop up in just a second here. Um, so Brian is a program assistant at Penn State Extension at the um, Lehigh County office where he assists farmers and markets with marketing and regulations and food system value chain. Brian is the co-chair of the Chesapeake Farm to Institution Workgroup and has an extensive list of other food and farm board commitments. Um, for the last 20 years, Brian and his wife, Holly, have owned and run Green Haven Farm, raising grass-fed livestock on their 27-acre farm um, in Berks County. So with that, uh, welcome, Brian. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I, my role here, too, is also to kind of give a brief um, overview of, the, um, of yesterday's webinar which uh, if you didn't see it, um, I encourage you to, to take a look at it. I thought it was very well done. And just to give you some takeaways from it, yesterday's webinar was mainly um, geared towards uh, farmers and producers, food producers, and about and giving them kind of a, an overview of the various types of um, food safety requirements that they can think about how that, does that apply to their business and what they should need to pay attention to and maybe don't need to pay attention to or little or less attention to. So for me, some takeaways that I came away with was um, our first presenter yesterday from um, uh, Virginia Extension Service was talking about a survey that they did to buyers on their priorities uh, they need to have met uh, for to be able to purchase from uh, farms. And uh, food safety was one of nine issues that were important to them. And I thought that was that was very interesting. So I think from a farmer standpoint, you're generally thinking of, well, what are my food safety requirements to sell into a wholesale market? That's only really one issue of many that would need to be addressed. Um, requirements uh, vary depending on who your customer is. If I'm selling, it may be different um, expectations of me if I'm selling to a school district or I'm selling to a healthcare facility or I'm selling to restaurants. Um, and also the fact that um, the food hubs and aggregators can uh, play a key role as an uh, intermediary between farmers and institutions, making everybody's uh, lives a little easier. And um, for the uh, marketplace where more prepared foods uh, might occur, that they really need to consider a, um, a HACCP plan or um, for determining where those, those potential hazards are in their processing facility. And um, also that this uh, year would be a really good year for producers to pay attention to this because there are many states um, uh, have subsidized uh, trainings for this year and they can um, attend really good food safety trainings for um, much less cost to them. And so uh, with that, before I uh, introduce our, our first presenter, uh, maybe we could take, um, we have uh, one or two polls we'd, we'd like you to take so we see who's attending us today. And we'll have that up for, for a few seconds here. And so if you fill out how this applies to you, and we can take, um, and then we'll take a look at the results of that.
maybe just a couple seconds left. Okay. So which role do you play in a food system? So as again, we still have a, a number of producers on here, uh, which is which is great. Uh, nonprofit affiliates, as you can see, some retail, food hubs. So it's a good it's a good mix mix of folks. So thank you for doing that. And then um, I think we have one more. And so, yeah, in general, how much do you need to know about food safety in your daily work? You could, would mind sharing that with us? So fair amount. I need to know more than the basics. Great, and then tremendous amount. So, great. So we hopefully we can address, um, start addressing some of those uh, questions you may have, or at least give you some um, information that can move this forward. So um, thank you for doing that. And our, I'm going to introduce our, our first presenter uh, today. Uh, Lindsay Gilmore is the owner of Organic Planet LLC. Um, she plays two roles professionally as a chef and culinary instructor specializing in healing food and as a food system consultant and educator. And I'm also happy to say that a friend of mine. Um, Thank you, Brian. I always learn a lot from, from Lindsay every time we, we get together. Uh, her particular areas of expertise are uh, harmonized gap, USDA group gap, and the FDA uh, food safety rule. Lindsay is co-chair of the Chesapeake Food Shed Network steering team and a board member of the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group. So welcome, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. I always like it when you acknowledge me as a friend. <laughs> Makes me feel good. Um, hi, everyone. I am going to give a very high level um, review of different kinds of market segments and what they look for. Um, this actually is a PowerPoint presentation that Lisa Rita from Local Food Hub uh, did with, I, I was part of a, uh, a session at Future Harvest Casa conference this year and um, Lisa and Allison, who you're going to hear from next, and I all presented on food safety and other kinds of requirements for wholesale buyers. So Lisa was unable to join us today, so I very kindly is allowing me to use her great presentation. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about preventative controls and um, when farmers are exempt, when farmers need to comply. It was something that uh, Dr. Rohan TKK spoke about yesterday, and we couldn't really get into too much of exemptions and compliance dates and that kind of stuff. So. Again, as with yesterday, this is a very high level review of some very complex information. So we do want to know from you if you would like to dig into any particular focused area and, and, if we're and see if we're able to provide that opportunity for people who are participating today and yesterday. So uh, as I said, we're, I'm going to use Lisa's um, presentation here and uh, jump right in. So if you're looking at selling to inst the institutional marketplace, um, very often they are, the food service on, in a, at an institution is contract managed. There are the big, the big companies, uh, the big three, Aramark, Sodexo, and Compass. Um, they each have different divisions that work with different kinds of institutional markets. Um, there are self-managed or self-operated food service. Um, those are generally the easiest and the more progressive um, food service operators. And uh, it, that quite often they're the easiest, by and large, they are the easiest um, institutional food service folks to work with when you want to sell into them. And so it's a very large market and often they serve at least 350 meals a day. In some cases, it can be thousands of meals a day, depending on the size of the operation. Uh, they're used to having very competitive contracts with their primary suppliers. 
So pricing is very definitely an issue for them. And uh, they also get the benefit of rebates if they're buying in larger quantities from their primary suppliers. So you do, you do, have, you do come up against that. It's not impossible if you can find institutional food service folks like Steve, who we're gonna hear from Nick, uh, later, uh, who are food, local food and regional food champions, they will work really hard on your behalf, on the behalf of, of farmers to get local food into their operation. So in terms of compliance, typically it is very rigorous. They always require product liability insurance. Um, food safety, again, is getting more rigorous. Um, they typically do want a third party certification. It, you may be able to get away with Maryland GAP for some institutions. You may have to go to a USDA GAP program. You may have to go to something more rigorous like Global GAP, Primus GFS, Canada, Canada GAP's actually yeah, and Canada again. There's, there are, we did do uh, last year um, a navigating the food safety landscape, and I went into a little bit more detail on all the different kinds of GAP certifications that are out there. So I'm not going to go into detail here. In terms of their service needs, they want a refrigerated delivery. Um, their orders can vary. Um, it can be surprising actually how little an institution will buy, but if you become a solid, consistent, reliable supplier, then you're gonna get larger orders from them. And they will typically prefer to have several deliveries per week. And their payment terms can be long. The institutional <laughs> market is, it's, you need a lot of helpers and there are a lot of helpers like Healthcare With at Harm and others who, will, who are paving the way for local food to get into the institutional marketplace. And you do need all the help that you can get. Um, so make the most of it. So quite often they have very long payment terms. It can even get up to net 90. So you need to think that through before you get into this market. The distributor. So there's a couple of different kinds of just, well, there's many different kinds of distributors, but two main um, uh, categories. One is a broadline distribu distributor, like the two major ones, Cisco and US Foods. There's others like Reinhardt and and that's the only one I can think of right now. They typically have all kinds of products, including uh, paper towels and, and uh, cleaning products and all kinds of stuff. And very often they have a subsidiary, a regional subsidiary that handles their produce needs. And then there are the regional uh, companies and re their regions can be pretty large that um, just handle for the most part produce in our region, Kini, Coastal Sunbelt, and Four Seasons are three of the big ones. Um, there are also many, many smaller regional distributors that may handle just produce or may handle a wide variety of products. They are looking for competitive wholesale pricing. They're used to riding the market pricing. Um, some of them actually like to work with farmers who say, I'm gonna give you one price throughout the season. Um, and then everybody's gambling. So if the market price goes way up, the farmer loses. If the market price goes way down, the farmer wins. But market pricing is, a, it, it's a ride. Um, they are very sensitive to product quality, very not keen at all on surprises. So order shorts can be a real problem for them. And um, they're sensitive to delivery timing as well. So with compliance, broadline, the big broad line is definitely a rigorous. Um, I think at this point, just about everybody needs product liability, wholesale anyway needs product liability insurance. Uh, the smaller ones are moderate to rigorous. Um, it, again, it depends on, same, yeah, in, in the case of the regional distributors, it really depends on what their customers are requiring. In terms of food safety, again, rigorous, many of them actually, the larger ones, um, in certain areas, they're looking for something more like Primus GFS or Global Gap, which is a more rigorous food safety standard. But there are still some that are happy with USDA Harmonized Gap. Uh, there may even be some, well, uh, probably not broadliners. Some of the regional produce companies may still be satisfied with um, a Maryland Gap if you live in Maryland, but certainly would be happy with USDA Harmonized Gap. And again, there is this trending towards everyone requiring some kind of GAP certification, regardless of your status with the Food Safety Modernization Act and the Produce Safety Rule. If your buyer requires GAP certification, then if you want to sell to them, you have to get GAP certified and do everything it takes to get to that. 
Um, their service needs, they also would like refrigerated delivery. They have scheduled dock times. Sometimes they can actually charge you for docking and cross docking. They have very strict quality standards. And their terms are better than institutional food service, so net 15 to net 30. A chain grocery market, so you've got the big national ones like Whole Foods Market, Food Lion, Walmart, Costco. No, Costco's kind of a market. I mean, it's a, not really, Costco is Costco. <laughs> uh, and then you have the regional ones. In our region, we have Wagmans, Martins, Moms. Um, it's a, this can be a very large volume market, um, especially in the larger cities. Uh, they might be willing to pay a little bit of a better price than distributors. Uh, keep in mind with a distributor that they, they want what are considered distributor prices. So they're going to be tacking on their own markup before they sell it to someone like a chain grocery store or institutional food service provider. So a distributor pricing can be lower than regular wholesale pricing. But a chain grocery market is past, they're, they're charging retail from their point. So um, they are a little bit less sensitive on price, sometimes less sensitive on price. Um, compliance, they will definitely require food safety, uh, I'm sorry, liability insurance. Um, they, the food safety certification really started with the, whole, the, the grocery chain market. So typically they are all requiring something at this point. Uh, and how, probably USDA harmonized GATT would be the minimum. They also want refrigerated delivery. They have strict quality standards. They may want uh, delivery right to the door of the, of the grocery store. Some of them have um, a warehousing, like aggregation warehousing. They may want you to deliver there. It depends on the, on the market. And then their terms are the same as distributors, 15 to 30. So the independent, and th this is really, selling to restaurants and caterers is still considered wholesale. Um, and also to independent grocery stores, co-ops, that kind of thing. This is still wholesale selling. They do tend to be a bit more high maintenance on communication. Um, Lisa has put in here billing and collections. I'm not exactly sure what she meant by that, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, they will typically pay more of a premium, even though it's a wholesale price. They will go higher, certainly, than the larger distribution and food service markets, and certainly a bit more than, than regular supermarkets. Um, they are probably going to be a bit more concerned about growing methods, so that's where the mission alignment comes in. They might, might require um, materials from you to be able to market to their customers. And they might, in the, the smaller grocery stores, might want you to do demos at the store. So they can say, here's our farmer, look at them, that's great. Um, typically compliance is minimal, although I think it, it's a good idea to have the liability insurance. Food safety, often at this point, still not required. That will probably change with the smaller grocery stores, but I don't know that chefs are going to require food safety unless it's a chain store and you will be a chain restaurant a group such as Sweet Green, and you're going to hear about that from Allison. But individual smaller restaurants typically are not requiring food safety certification. They, are, they do tend to have very small orders. Um, as I said earlier, there can be a lot of communication. Yeah, the, the, the payment terms. It's a good idea to ask for cash on delivery, but they do tend to be shorter. However, and this is an important however at the bottom here, personnel changes in restaurants are really common. Um, chefs come and go. And so you may want to follow the chef rather than the restaurant. Business close, businesses close frequently. So you have to think that through. You may want to talk to your peers, other people that sell to the business, see how solid they are before you dive into that market. And then finally, just for comparison, farmers who are looking at doing their own retail or sell CSA, farm market, farmers markets, online selling, um, you get the premium price. You're selling retail when you do that. Um, medium market with large percentage attrition. Again, I'm not exactly sure what I should have asked Lisa about that one. It is, you do have to be acquiring new customers year after year, and there's a lot of uh, uh, communication required, a lot of schmoozing required. Um, you may need to be sending out 
menus, recipes, that kind of stuff to help people understand how to use the products that you grow. So there's a lot of, a lot of customer service and it's a different kind of marketing strategy. You can't just grow a lot of product and sell it to one or two customers. You're dealing with a lot of customers. So the compliance, you are basically subject to state and local laws regarding sales tax because you're selling retail and you may need to get a business license depending on where you are. Uh, food safety, again, in this case, you're just subject to state and local laws. Um, if, you're, if you've got a really big CSA, if you're, if you're grossing over $500,000 a year, then you will have to comply with the produce safety rule. And then, as I said earlier, lots of communication, lots of question answering, lots of dealing with individuals. And of course, the payment terms are a heck of a lot better. Mostly people are paying you right there or paying you ahead of time in the season. Huh, okay, thank you, Lisa Rita, for all of that information. Um, yep. Sorry, do you know how long I've been talking? <laughs> I forgot to turn off. Well, I'm just gonna run through these next slides really quickly because I don't know how long I've been talking. Um, so really quickly, the preventative controls for human food, the full name for that is hazard analysis and risk-based preventative controls for human food also known as preventative controls for human food, also known as preventative controls rule, which is those of us in the business usually call it, and sometimes we just call it PCs for short. HARP-C is not typically used. Uh, so when a farm is exempt, when you're doing any of these things, gathering, cutting, removing or trimming out of leaves, husk roots or stems, field coring, if you're shelling, hulling, sifting and threshing, filtering, I'm not exactly sure what filtering is. Somebody said honey the other day, but that doesn't quite fit with produce. So I, if somebody could tell me what's meant here by filtering, I would appreciate it. And then washing and cooling. These are all considered um, harvest activities under the farming definition for the Food Safety Modernization Act. So you do not jump into the preventative controls for human food, which is typically what facilities have to fulfill. Again, um, things that are considered farm activities are drying. So you could be making teas, you could be doing dried herbs, um, you could be doing dried garlic, dried fruit, dried pe peppers, chili peppers, as it's shown in this photograph. If you're treating fruit for ripening or other kinds of produce for ripening, that's still considered a farm operation. And, and thankfully, packaging and labeling are also considered farming activities. And if you or your, if you are putting your products through a kill step or you're selling to someone who puts your products through a kill step, then these things are considered exempt. So things like high acid canning, blanching and freezing, distilling or winemaking. Uh, if, you're, if you're making flour from grain, actually, um, I will say right up front, I am not an expert on the exemptions for preventative controls. So if there are a lot of quick specific questions around this, we need to bring in probably someone from the FDA to help answer those questions. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of things that people do. And uh, it's really hard to say a blanket statement about things. But these are the easy things, the high acid canning, the blanching, the distilling or winemaking. These are definitely kill steps. And then there, are, there is annual documentation and written assurances along the supply chain, although some of that has been you've given a little bit more time to do that. Uh, when must farmers comply? If you're doing something like raw pickles, so lactic acid pickles, diced or sliced produce, if you're making prepared salads of some kind, then you get into the processing realm and uh, you do have to comply with preventative controls. There may be other things you need to comply with, comply with for your municipality or township or whatever. So you need to really work with your COP extension to figure out what it is you need if you're going to do processing on the farm. There is this new and, um, of course, somewhat confusing enforcement discretion policy. Um, Adam, who's going to talk later, the, from uh, Appalachian Harvest, has actually benefited from this because Appalachian Harvest only uh, holds, stores, and distributes produce, and they don't repack anything, they don't break anything open, they actually get to just follow the preventative controls, I mean, sorry, the produce safety rule. Brian, I see you there, which means I need to shut up. <laughs> Here's the compliance dates, and that's it, I'm done. Oh, very good. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was a lot of information. Um, Always. And then you'll be back for the, we have Q&A at the end, and we're getting a couple 
Uh, I saw we have one question come in so far, so thank you for that. Uh, if you have, again, if you have questions for the, uh, the panelists, please enter them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to those by the uh, end of um, our presentations here. Um, our next presenter uh, is Allison Blansfield. Allison joined Sweet Green in October 2016, which I think is, I met Allison around that same time shortly after she started working with Sweet Greens, trying to help her find farmers here in the Lehigh Valley to work with. And as the value chain manager, Allison is helping to lead an integrated national approach to supporting value chains in each Sweet Green market. Allison works to uh, continually build and strengthen partnerships with farmers using sustainable and regenerative methods to manage their land. So welcome, Allison. Thank you for joining us. Great, thanks, Brian. All right. Hi, everyone. So um, as Brian said, my name's Allison. I'm the value chain coordinator uh, for Sweet Green. We're a fast casual restaurant chain um, with roots in the DC, Maryland area. Uh, we started about 10 years ago um, as an idea by three young um, college students seeing a need for access to healthy, um, you know, delicious and accessible uh, food. And they, they kind of launched the idea with, uh, you know, why don't we offer salads? Um, today we have about 87 locations across the country, um, mainly situated in what we call six different markets um, from, you know, DC to Boston. We also have a few stores um, in Chicago, as well as um, San Francisco and LA. Um, so I um, work on the value chain team. We also, the value chain team is part of the supply chain team. And we always kind of describe the, the value chain team deals with the first mile um, on the food journey and our supply chain team deals with the last mile. So, um, I specifically oversee all of our direct farmer relationships, um, both along the East Coast and in Chicago. We also have a value chain coordinator who works on the West Coast and oversees um, all of our farm relationships in California. Um, we work with a produce distributor in each market. So as Lindsay had mentioned, um, you know, there are uh, broadliners, there are very large distributors. We choose to work with um, a kind of regionally focused produce distributor in each of our markets and um, kind of act as an intermediary. Um, we're kind of both a buyer and a value chain coordinator. We kind of act, we sit at the intersection between both a local farmer and um, a distributor. And so we as the customer are kind of facilitating a lot of the communication and helping to smooth some, some of the, you know, issues and speed bumps that happen when um, we're trying to bring uh, small and mid-sized farms into, into a local supply chain. All right. Next slide here. Okay, so um, just a quick overview of our mission. Our mission is to inspire healthier communities by connecting people to real food. And our uh, core values are really what drive our mission. And um, these are our core values here up on the screen. And you know, I generally like to think of them as centering around authenticity. We go to great lengths as a value chain team to really uh, build authentic relationships, both with our farmers, um, with the distributors that we work with, um, and really all of our interactions as we move from both, you know, from the farm all the way through um, to our actual stores. Beyond um, kind of setting up these regional supply chains, you know, we have a, a tool we called our food ethos that really drives our sourcing decisions. Um, so, Essentially what we do is we are measuring each of the ingredients that we source um, on the basis of how healthy is that individual ingredient, how sustainably was it produced, and the locality of that, of that ingredient, so where was it produced. And so our food ethos in a sense has really driven us to create our seasonal menu, uh, which makes sense. Um, our menu now in each market changes five times a year. 
and that's really been driven through this constant iteration of our, you know, of our of our food ethos. Um, we also look to be as transparent um, as possible in what we're sourcing and how we're sourcing it, and we kind of flow that through also into you know how we act and show up in each of our um, each of our locations. So we scratch cook in each of our stores. That's something that we started with at you know location number one, and we still apply to every single one of our locations across the country today. Ten years later, um, we have a very big commitment to um, dealing with raw produce cooking our ingredients every day, making our own drinks every day, making our own dressings every day. We really do feel that that not only um, trans translates, translates a huge um, kind of uh, level of transparency, but also uh, we think really also makes our, our products taste good. I would say that before I get into kind of the wholesale readiness from a uh, from this standpoint in terms of certifications and food safety, we also have a large focus on um, our growers kind of growing practices. Um, we we want to support growers of all sizes and we, we take a lot of um, time and effort to work with um, small and mid-sized growers who are looking to scale up. We also are looking to work with growers who really have a focus on soil health. Um, so more so than just certified organic, although we do work with a lot of certified organic growers that are great, we are also looking um, for great growers that are you know, cover cropping a majority of the year, maybe doing um, you know, a certain level of minimal or reduced tillage, um, are you know, really looking at soil organic matter as a measurement of kind of their regenerative practices. We're always looking for you know, great growers who are kind of going the extra mile. We do feel that you know, we wanna be able to pay a fair price for you know, those investments and those inputs that these great growers are making to you know, not only uh, protect the environment, but we also feel like growing more nutritious food with those, with those methods. So in terms of wholesale readiness, um, we are, as Lindsay had mentioned, we do require a minimum of a state gap certification um, to flow through our supply chain. Um, so food safety is, is definitely the first and foremost most important thing that we require. Um, we also, in terms of volume and kind of um, production practices, you know, do require for many of our um, products, you know, a certain level of hydro cooling and washing equipment, obviously. Um, we do require the ability to maintain the cold chain, um, you know, from both, you know, from harvest to post-harvest into um, and through our distributors, uh, warehouses that then go into our stores. For specs, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on specs in a moment here. We actually are a pretty flexible buyer as, um, as it relates to specifications. We are, um, we're not a retailer, so produce does not have to look pretty for us. Um, so that's been a great, it, it, it's allowed us a great level of ability to work with growers on number two product, B grade product. Um, and just, I think we're slightly more flexible buyer in that sense. And um, I personally get really excited about working with growers around creative, creative specs. Um, in terms of consistency, you know, we do, um, the way that we set up our um, supply chain is that we work well in advance with a grower to plan out, you know, um, you know, we would, we want to buy X number of beets from you a week. We have a forecaster on our team that's able to provide some level of our best guess, <laughs> you know, nothing's ever uh, in stone, but we're able to provide our best guess of what we think our weekly volume is going to be. Um, and we like to set a, um, a price point that's fair for that for that grower um, that we would maintain, you know, throughout the um, the span of that buying period. Um, so for you know, we require that a grower has a certain level of ability to you know plan for volume and um, and harvest fairly consistently. Consistently, I will make a note that we um, one of the values of our supply chain is being able to lean on our distributors when there are um, 
local, you know, challenges with weather or pest or disease, you know, and any issue, any number of issues that can come up in working with um, local growers, we can lean on our distributor um, to be able to backfill, let's say, a sub product for the length of time that we may need um, should there be an issue with, with one of our local farm partners. Um, in that sense, it's nice because we can, um, again, be that kind of bridge for maybe a slightly newer grower in the wholesale realm that's looking to scale up. Uh, we can be a slightly more, I think, flexible or, or lenient buyer in that sense um, with regards to consistency. All right. Oops, bear with me a second here. There we go. Um, just a couple opportunities and challenges, as I mentioned, um, our, again, our, our spec flexibility, we're able to source um, consistently number two sweet potatoes, organic sweet potatoes from great growers. We work on number two organic carrots with great growers. Um, we're able to, you know, our, our seasonal menu changes year over year. Um, our value chain team is on the ground talking to growers constantly. And with that, we have a direct line back to our chef um, our team, we sit on the same team as the chef. We meet with him every week. So in that sense, we're really able to um, iterate our menu year over year and really start to create menus that reflect what our growers want to grow. Um, and that, that's been kind of an ever-evolving process. Um, we're a very consistent buyer in the sense that, like I said, we look to work directly with uh, you know, a grower for a certain ingredient. And we want, you know, we'd like to set a price point and you know, we will run that menu for a certain amount of time and, and that will be the relationship. Um, we also look to plan our menus out as far in advance as possible so that we can crop plan with our growers in the, in the winter. Um, and then the challenges that we have are, I think, challenges that the, you know, larger region and food system in general deals with um, every day. Food safety, obviously, we've, we're talking about that, but local freight, I think, is always going to be um, something that uh, is, a, is a challenge. Um, I think just that has always been something that, you know, how can we efficiently get product in from various small growers at a price point that is, um, that is a win for both the grower and the win for, for the customer. And then these are just some very quick examples of some, some um, specs that we use. Our, our kale spec is, is slightly different than a typical 24 or 12 bunch case. We work with our growers, our local growers, to do a, a larger format um, case of kale. Um, for us, it helps minimize some waste on our end. And we ask for a short stem cut on our kale. Um, so we're not kind of uh, flowing through a ton of waste in each of our stores at that point. Um, extensive hydro cooling is definitely a must with this case. Um, it's it's, you know, you, a, a farmer may have a lot of success in cooling a 12 or 24 bunch um, case of kale, but uh, we've found that the way that we have as a bulk pack, there's no bunches, it's a lot harder to make sure that that entire case is cooled to, um, you know, at least 40 degrees so that we do not have any yellowing. And you can kind of see uh, an example of some of the, the yellowing that can occur with our, with our case pack. With carrots, I kind of already explained that we do have a flexible spec on carrots. We often um, source number two organic carrots. This is kind of a very typical um, wholesale case pack in terms that it's a 25 pound bag with no tops and is a washed carrot. And then our apple spec is very flexible as well. Um, you know, we we work with our regional um, apple orchards and source a variety of different um, apple varieties uh, so that we're able to stay in that local grower for you know, 10, 11 months. Obviously, it, would, uh, it wouldn't work if we just said our, okay, we're only gonna source a Fuji apple. Okay, great, well, maybe we can source a Fuji apple for only four months out of the year. Um, for us, you know, we look to source a number of different varieties of apples that allow us to stay with that local grower, you know, for the maximum amount of time that we can throughout the year um, with that with that um, single farm. So we're fairly flexible on our apple spec. Um, we don't require we don't require stickers. Um, 
and we're even, you know, we work also even on a volume filled case um, as opposed to a trade case in that sense. So our sizing can also be fairly flexible. Uh, so those are just a couple examples of, you know, some specific specs from our end. And um, I know my time is running short at this point and I just wanted to, you know, give you guys a good example of just as, uh, as a buyer here, what are some of the things that Sweetgreen does to connect with growers and also kind of the basic requirements uh, to, working, to working with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. That was, that was great. That was helpful. Um, our next presenter, Adam Watson. Adam is a native of Whitley County, Kentucky, joined ASD's Appalachian Harvest Food Hub in Duffield, Virginia, as a compliance and grower manager in uh, 2017. He comes to ASD after more than seven years with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, where he managed a USDA accredited organic certifier and uh, consulted with farmers on GAP and on-farm food safety. So welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So as Brian was saying, I work for Appalachian Sustainable Development and our food hub is Appalachian Harvest. So ASD's mission is to help uh, the entire Central Appalachian region uh, to become healthier, to have a better economy, and more opportunities for local agriculture specifically. And to accomplish that, one of the things we focus on, and ASD does a number of different activities. If you're not familiar with the organization, I encourage you to take a look. We do uh, food access as well as some other things as well that you may be interested in, but I don't have time to go into detail with those today. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, this is going to save a little bit of time. Uh, what we do at Appalachian Harvest is work closely with growers uh, to aggregate product together and then distribute it out to buyers. So we allow smaller and mid-sized growers who may not have the infrastructure on their farms uh, or the experience uh, to access these larger markets that give them opportunities. So we have a lot of growers who may be experienced with farmers markets, CSAs, but they're looking maybe to transition from part-time farming to full-time farming. And that sort of income jump oftentimes has a wholesale as part of the mix. And so we provide that opportunity we kind of ease the entry into those markets. Specifically, Appalachian Harvest, the food hub was started in 2000. Uh, our main buyers are grocery store chains, but we do actually also sell to uh, produce brokers. And as Lindsay was saying, uh, the direct delivery to grocery store chain DCs actually comes with a price premium. It does allow us to uh, return back to the farmer uh, a greater uh, amount of what we receive, uh, but because the volume we're dealing in now, we do have to work with other distributors, a lower price, but allows us to handle larger volume for our farmers. Uh, we are primarily fresh whole produce. We have a very small percentage of some value added products that are branded uh, with Appalachian Harvest. Additionally, last year, we just started a um, herb hub uh, that's similar to our uh, vegetable hub, uh, but, uh, Again, we started with two species last year, looking to expand that as just in the beginning. Um, our mix of products are about 10% certified organic, 90% conventional. We are seeing both in growth, er uh, uh, growth in both areas. Uh, so there's opportunities for farmers uh, of either uh, production method. Uh, our basic infrastructure that we have is a 15,000 square foot facility. Uh, about a third of that space is cooler space. So we have two coolers, but three temperature zones in there that allow us to handle a diversity of product. We have two tractor trailers uh, and refrigerated trailers. Uh, we have four full-time staff here at this facility, two part-time staff and two drivers. Uh, and of course, there are several other people associated in the background with finance and things of that nature uh, that are with the home office. I do wanna stress that we are an aggregator and distributor. Uh, and it goes to some of what Lindsay was saying in reference to preventive controls and exemptions. Uh, we are not a packer per se in FDA language. The issue is though, we do some activities that if they were occurring on a farm and solely on a farm, would never get any scrutiny from FDA. But because we ourselves are not technically a farm entity, it then becomes a little bit of a situation 
where uh, it's not obvious whether or not there is um, an exemption there. And so uh, I'm not an expert on those um, exemptions when it comes to the preventative controls. Uh, I will agree with Lindsay that I would offer what I could, but I'm not gonna be in a situation to uh, do that. And one moment, because I'm having a slight difficulty, it's now telling you my screen is paused. There we go. Let's go back to that. Okay, now we're back. And so uh, I would just say, if you have questions about preventive controls, if you have questions about exemptions, uh, that's something maybe as a larger group that we can help with. Uh, we were the beneficiaries of that, uh, but uh, it's one of those things when you get the answer you want, you don't keep digging to find out why. So I can't uh, kind of give you a behind the scenes look. I just know it turned out well for us. Um, when we talk about the history of Appalachian harvest, we have had sales for a number of years. Uh, and this is just giving you a general trend. It doesn't have the latest of 2017 on there. I'm not an economist, but I know that this is a trend that you like to see. It's going in the right direction. Um, and I will say that, you know, as food hubs go, uh, it is a challenge as you're growing because uh, some of the things that you start with, uh, for instance, Appalachian Harvest started as solely certified organic product, but that was definitely limiting what was possible uh, for us to do in the marketplace. And so by expanding uh, even from there uh, to conventional produce allowed us to keep moving forward. Um, we started out serving primarily Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. We've now expanded further. So we have some growers in Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, as well as a couple in North Carolina. And so, you know, our growth is something that uh, we continue to look at. Uh, we really like the increases we're seeing over the past five years. Uh, but the reality is we're reaching a point now where we have to consider, can we continue at the same rate? And so we're always examining what does growth in the next two years, three years looks like for us and is all growth good growth? And so we have to figure out, can we grow and meet the needs of farmers at the same time we're growing sales? So what we offer to our farmers is free grading and packaging training. This is really important for farmers that are new to wholesale markets. They may not necessarily have experience packing a number one for a grocery store market. And so that is important. Uh, and so we work with growers closely on that to make sure they feel comfortable with it and the product they're bringing to us is appropriate. We also do free gap audit training and farm safety plan consulting. So we actually have a curriculum I'll talk more about later. We do some production consultation. Uh, we don't attempt to replace cooperative extension. Uh, we would never have the capacity to even attempt it. Uh, but we do uh, visit our farmers uh, and sometimes our farmers may or may not be familiar with cooperative extension. Uh, because we're working in such a large regional area, when you look at all the different states, sometimes the local county agent is not familiar with vegetable production. They may be well versed with livestock or something like that. And so we try to fill in and meet the needs where we can. We've got some tremendous agents and specialists that we work with, and we would never attempt to replace those. So we're always happy to coordinate and collaborate with them. We also offer a organic growers group, and the benefit to growers is that allows them to uh, receive organic certification at a lesser rate. It does limit uh, exactly where they can sell their products, so it's not a fit for all our growers. So we have a number of independently uh, certified farmers as well. Either works for us, but that's one option that sometimes beginning farmers will start with. We also source packaging for our farmers. Uh, we get a little bit better pricing because we can buy in larger quantities. Um, obviously, that's not something we can provide free to our growers. We do pay 21 days after sale. Uh, and one thing that may be different from a lot of other uh, outlets in the wholesale produce world, we actually operate on a commission. So I think growers always are worried, especially when they're new to wholesale, how do I know I'm getting a fair price? Uh, with Appalachian Harvest, we operate on commission. So uh, the greater price we get for you is the greater return for us. So I, th I think that's something very comfortable both for us as well as for growers. So when it comes to certifications, obviously if we're selling certified organic, it's gonna be certified. But additionally, we require at least, uh, at a minimum, uh, USDA GAP certification. Uh, this is because it's what's required of our buyers. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute, how that may be changing for us. 
to get to this point. So, you know, we don't just tell growers they have to have it and go find it. Uh, we actually work directly with growers. Uh, beginning in 2009, a curriculum was created in cooperation with uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension. Uh, and it is a, um, it's more than just a class. It's actually teaching a systemic approach uh, to compliance and implementation of a gap plan or farm safety manual. Uh, it is focused on USDA gap with, uh, with um, covering the general as well as part one farm review. Because when you look at USDA gap, the minimum requirement to be certified under that scheme is to cover the general questions as well as one other section. And so what we do is we teach general as well as the part one farm review. And by focusing on that, we're limiting the training to one day, but we're going really in depth, going through question by question and allowing growers uh, to actually better understand and see uh, what that looks like. So uh, the good thing about this curriculum is that it's built so that it does expand into the other sections of the GAT GIP USDA uh, scheme. And also it expands to gap harmonize as well as global markets addendum. So a grower can start and then keep expanding under this same curriculum and able to reach uh, their uh, requirements uh, for markets, whether it's us or someone else. Uh, and another thing sometimes that's left out of some of these trainings, we actually show them the forms and give them the basic process of how they actually go about getting the audit on their farm. So sometimes it's who do I contact, how do I do that, and so we help with that. Um, we do farm visits, uh, and so one of the big things we do with that every year is we do a review of their farm safety plan. Uh, we generally refer to those as plan of action manuals. Uh, we also will do mock audits, and so we actually go through and act as if we are the auditor and see are they going to pass, or do we have areas that need any sort of work or any improvement. Uh, we also, for our growers that grow for us, we serve to coordinate uh, the auditor's schedule. Uh, one of the things that helps reduce the cost for our clients is doing multiple audits in a region on the same day or depending on the size of the operation on consecutive days. And so we help coordinate that uh, just to make it easier for the auditor. We've got a very good relationship with the auditors in Virginia, especially. Uh, they actually are Virginia Department of Ag employees, uh, but they wear a federal hat uh, whenever they're doing these tasks. And one of the big things we just do is we serve as an uh, information source for producers uh, to come in and actually um, continue their education. Um, and so the picture there was one grower that's actually having a bear walk on his plastic. Didn't really have a lot of solutions for him, other than maybe run really fast if he saw him when he was in the field. Um, our own certification as a facility, we are also USDA GAP, uh, or probably more properly GIP, Good Handling Practices, or GHP. We do sections six and seven, which cover wholesale distribution, terminal warehouses, and uh, preventive food defense. Uh, but this is going to be changing for us because we've had a buyer request that for 2018 that we go ahead and jump up to the harmonized level. The reason they've asked that is one of their buyers has asked for that. And so it, there really is kind of a trickle down request when it comes to food safety. So we're going to go ahead and do this for 2018. Uh, I will expand what we're already doing at our facility, but isn't a complete change for what's happening. Uh, but we're also putting this on the radar of all our growers. Um, we do think the next, you know, two to three years, it may be more common that we see requests for harmonized audit, even through our customers. So it is something that uh, we're uh, making sure growers understand they may not be able to stay where they're at. Um, real quickly, with FISMA compliance, we do host um, the approved Produce uh, Safety Alliance grower trainings for our clients. We've got one coming up this uh, April. Uh, it is a scenario where we want to provide ongoing consultation with them in regards to FISMA. I would agree that if you're already doing GAP, you are very close to full compliance with FISMA, uh, with very little tweaks associated with it. But I have seen some growers that are reluctant even to do GAP, especially new ones, because in their mind, they're like, well, if should I go through the trouble of GAP if FISMA is going to keep me out of production or if FISMA is uh, you know, a bridge too far? I don't think it is. Uh, I think it's very approachable, both of those for growers. Uh, if growers are serious about doing it. So this is one of the reasons why we are hosting these trainings. And with that, I'll go ahead and end. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Adam. And words to remember by always outrun the bear. <laughs> so um, 
Now, uh, for our respondents this afternoon, we have uh, Stephen Ferguson. Uh, Stephen is manager of food services at Wellspan York Hospital in York, Pennsylvania. He has over 30 years of healthcare food service experience and is also a registered dietitian. Uh, Steve is a member of the York County Food Alliance and has chaired the Farm to Institution work group for the Alliance. So uh, welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to be with everyone today. And um, I was asked to speak a little bit about some of our um, uh, fine requirements uh, and certifications that we're asking for because um, we're getting ready to start a, um, uh, a dealing with uh, our local uh, food hub, the South Central Pennsylvania Harvest Hub. And we want to be able to uh, make sure that uh, we are purchasing produce um, that is uh, safe and wholesome for our patients. Uh, just a little bit about Wellspan Health. We're a six hospital, soon to be eight hospital uh, regional system in South Central Pennsylvania. We'll be covering about five counties. Uh, we're located in some of the best agricultural area of Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, our local Adams County to the west of York is uh, noted for apples, and that's where one of our hospitals, Gettysburg Hospital, is located. Uh, then over in uh, east of us, across the Susquehanna River, we have Lancaster County, which is Amish country. We have uh, Ephrata Community Hospital located there. So York Hospital, which is the largest uh, facility of the Wellspan system is right in the middle of, again, some of the best agricultural area in Pennsylvania. And York County itself is very, uh, very well known for agriculture. So we want to take advantage of uh, the um, local in-season produce. And uh, we've had in, in the past some uh, local produce that we've offered through our local purveyor, uh, especially Adams County apples and so on. But uh, there's a plethora of, of great produce that we want to be able to offer our patients and our customers and staff uh, at our facilities. So we'll be starting uh, that very shortly. Um, and I want to thank also Kristen Markley with the Healthcare Without Harm for helping us with this uh, endeavor. Um, so what we're asking, and, and we still haven't really drawn up a final dra uh, draft of this of the requirements, but uh, we are asking that uh, our, our suppliers be GAP certified and also cover a, uh, uh, a reasonable amount of product liability insurance. Um, I'm not sure again what that amount would be, but I've heard like a million dollars or at least $600,000. A lot of farmers markets require a minimum of $600,000 and some up to a million dollars or more. But uh, I think those two areas are the main starting points for us for uh, requirements for our uh, for the what we purchase. Um, I'm always open for any other uh, discussion if anybody has any questions or um, or any answers to help me with that area if anyone else in other facilities um, setting up their programs uh, I would be happy to uh, hear from you and uh, to get some of your ideas also please. So um, I think in the next month or so, we'll be ready to get started. We're just into the, um, getting into the growing season soon in, in this area. The winter seems to be hanging on a little longer than usual. We just had snow yesterday, so hopefully that'll be it for the, for the rest of this uh, spring. And um, so we're anxious to get started uh, with this endeavor. Brian, I don't have anything else. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah, it was a little, depressing watching snowfall on April 9th. Thanks. Um, so I think we have a few questions uh, still here. Some of them have been answered in the Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna go with, um, start with uh, Cliff here. Does Sweetgreen have a written guide on what they consider to be uh, practicing soil health and do they reward farmers for such practices? Yeah, great, thanks Cliff. Um, short answer to that is we don't have a written guide. I think this is a fairly new concept to, to Sweetgreen. I think since I joined about a year and a half ago, we've been trying to formulate this more and more. Um, but I think your suggestion and getting this down on paper is, is very important. Um, I mean, really, 
what we value is getting on the farm with the grower and kind of in real time talking, having a conversation with the grower around their practices. Um, at this point, we don't really have a very um, hard tool, you know, to kind of uh, assess it beyond our conversations, although we do take that data or, or you know, anecdotal uh, evidence per se um, and, and take that into account um, and kind of you know, put that together into a, a whole picture of what a grower is doing to um, kind of promote soil health on their farm. Thank you. I think I'll stick with you one more second, Allison. There's another question. I think it was, it was actually a follow up question that uh, was asked about um, you pay the, how do you work with the distributors to get the, the product from the farm to sweet greens? But then they asked uh, what you had answered and said you pay the farms directly or how. How do you handle covering the distributor? Uh, do you pay them directly for their work or? Yeah, no, so we, yes, we have an arrangement with each of our distributors where we do have a, a set markup. So we're able to work directly with our growers and also understand um, the price, you know, that Sweet Green will ultimately pay, pay for that product. Great. And then um, a question for you, Adam. Uh, what is the timeline of Appalachian harvest growth? How quickly did the team expand? And if I can just add to that, what's the, the business model or for-profit, non-profit, cooperative? Uh, we are a non-profit, a 501c3 through ASD, but we're allowed to make a profit. So we are operating as a business. It is our goal to make a profit. Um, and I just looked real briefly. So basically it, it took us year six to hit 500,000 in sales. And then I believe it was five years later. Let me pull back up that graphic. Um, and that's his anonymous. Yeah, I think five years later that we hit a million. And then we hit two million. Um, let's see here. Five years after that, I think. So it looks like we're doubling every five years right now. And so um, we've got the largest staff that we've ever had currently. Um, there were some other questions that were asked. Uh, we do have grant funding. So you may have noticed a 20% commission is pretty low. Uh, you can find studies that show for food hubs, that sort of commission is not gonna make you sustainable, not gonna keep you in operation. And, and I would agree with those studies, uh, but we do have grant funding uh, for certain elements that we do and that allows us to re return more back to the farmer. Great, thank you. Um, I have, uh, Maybe you can't answer this, Adam, because you, you had talked about um, what your requirements are for your own food safety standards. But so are you viewed as a pass through? I think currently like produce auctions are viewed as a pass through. Technically, yes, we're, we're, we're sort of hybrid and that's part of the complexity when it comes to the preventive control rules. Um, what we actually do is Appalachian Harvest. We are just an aggregator and distributor. So you deliver produce to us. We build a pallet, we put it on a truck, and we ship it. So we're just distributors. We are just a pass-through. The complexity comes with us is we have some wash lines and packing lines that our growers can use. So our facility, but it is a scenario where Appalachian Harvest itself doesn't do those activities. And so it's where, technically speaking, the farmer's the one that's actually doing any of those packing type activities. So it's just an extension of their farm or field not us, but again, we are the facility. So that, that's why it's the complex thing. So no, we don't offer currently any sort of packing activities. Uh, once upon a time, Appalachian Harvest did do that. Uh, when Appalachian Harvest did that, I believe the uh, commission was 35%. Okay, that makes kind of makes sense to me. The, um, Lindsay, maybe, um, this, this question you had already addressed in the, in the box, and maybe this will, uh, we have maybe had time for one more. Um, and someone was asking about how binding are the supply contracts with those who are uh, locked, who want a locked in price. So I guess they're asking if you are working with those. Sorry, yeah, so I'm going to right. pay one price. Mm -hmm. Cliff had asked that question. And, and um, actually, I when I was talking about farmers coming up with the price for the season. I was talking about the farmers themselves setting a price for the season. Alison, you might be better to answer the question. If you 
do you have any contracts with farmers where you set a price for the season and what do you do if there are weather problems or crop failures? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at, at this point, we don't have we don't have a contract with farmers. We do mostly handshakes. Um, you know, I think it's our belief that uh, we want farmers to be successful. Um, if there's some reason that partnering with us is not working for them, if meaning that they're bringing their product elsewhere or not following through on the intended relationship, then there's a reason why that relationship is not working. Um, so, I mean, at this point in our evolution, not to say that we, we won't do it going forward as, as we grow, but at this point, you know, we, we look to, you know, establish a handshake agreement with a grower and, and really base it on honestly, like on trust. And if it doesn't work out, you know, knowing that there's some reason that this wasn't a good fit for that grower. Um, you know, in the terms of uh, weather or, you know, um, issues with supply, um, again, like that is, that's something where we, we lean on our relationships with our distributors to help us bring in other product. Or at this point, you know, we lean on our value chain team to, you know, scramble and try to find, you know, mid-season another grower who's interested in working with Sweetgreen um, or who we've already spoken to and has product. Um, so ideally the, you know, the ideal is that that doesn't happen. Um, you know, we, we don't like to sub product, um, but we, we can if we need to with our distributors um, or we will, you know, uh, try to find another grower if there's, a, you know, an, an extended time period on that, on that product not being able to make it to us. Great, thank you. And um, I'm gonna take advantage of the privileges of being moderator. Uh, so I'm going to ask the last question. I want to ask uh, Steve, um, since you're entering into this, um, are you just picking a few products so you can kind of figure out how this is going to work or are you going kind of full tilt with multiple products? No, uh, that's, that's right, Brian. We're going to pick probably a few products. Um, something that's already easy to clean. I mean, we don't have the uh, like right now, most of our lettuce we already buy it. It's already washed and processed. We don't we don't clean it and so on. We don't have the the staff and the and the and the space usually to do a full blown uh, cleaning and processing. So, um, but something easy uh, in season. Uh, and we're going to start with three hospitals: uh, Gettysburg Hospital, our surgery rehab hospital here locally, uh, and then York Hospital, which is the largest. We're going to have uh, three out of the six hospitals start with. Uh, South Central uh, PA Harvest Hub, and uh, so it, we'll start small and work our way up, and and uh, hopefully uh, in another year or so, we're, we're going to monitor and track what we're buying and and to see the percentage of local produce, and so we can keep adding on each each year. Or so yes, great, thank you, and I want to thank all our uh, panelists uh, for for their great information today. Thank Lindsay, Adam. Allison and Steve, and I'll turn it back over to Lindsay Smith. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And yes, thank you so much um, to you and our panelists, um, the organizers of our webinar and our sponsors. Um, Yona, would you show the next step slide, please? Um, yeah, so we just wanted to encourage you to check out all of the great resources that we've put together for um, these and other webinars. Um, upcoming meetings of the Farm to Institution work group, of our local food distribution work group. You'll find notice of all of those um, through ChesapeakeFoodShed.net. Um, the um, Farm to Institution work group is um, ramping up. Yona, do you want to go to the next slide? Um, and so um, there'll be um, a lot more information about that forthcoming. I think the last word of um, thanks to you all is, um, I think we do have one or two unanswered questions. We'll be sure to follow up with um, answers for those. We would love to hear from you in the evaluation about um, additional questions around food safety um, or sort of other issues you're thinking about in trying to grow our local food economy. So with that, um, thank you so much, everybody and um, look forward to seeing you again soon.